Welcome everybody. My name is Matt Pickerell. I'm the Forest and Watershed Health Manager with the Nature Conservancy, also with the Rio Grande Water Fund. Um, so we've been doing these Taos Lecture Series things for a few years, I think, predating my time with, with TNC. Thank you to the Taos Key Valley Foundation, which is sponsoring this, this event. Um, the last few years, as you might have guessed, we've had to do them virtually, and they've mostly been sharing information out, latest science, but um, with this uh, event, we figured we'd make it a little more interactive and do a panel discussion. So we've got some folks that'll come up. I'll introduce them in a little bit. Um, so the, the agenda really briefly today, is gonna be about one third presentation. So I'll have a brief presentation and a video to share in a second here. And then we'll have another framing presentation from uh, Rachel Fo uh, with New Mexico State Forestry Division. And I'll do more of an intro for her in a few minutes. And then the last uh, two thirds of the evening will be the panel discussion. Um, we'll have uh, plenty of time for questions. And so I'd like to have at least one hour for that panel discussion, or we're starting just a teeny bit late. So we're looking at like uh, 7.30, I'm doing my math in my head, right? 7.30, uh, 7.45 is about a good stop. So I wanna make sure we have plenty of time for questions because that's the whole point of today, bringing everyone with one hour in person so we can have a dialogue. So with that, I'll uh, start over here. is amazing, but now more than ever, it's under threat. The Nature Conservancy has been partnering with communities to create a world where people and nature thrive since 1951. Today, we're facing the most complex challenges of our lives, and we have years, not decades, to address the interconnected climate and biodiversity crisis. We know how huge these goals are, but we also know how we can achieve them by reaching beyond boundaries and borders, across common grounds and great divides, through cutting edge science and age old wisdom. Together, we find a way to overcome barriers to progress so we can achieve our biggest, most ambitious goals yet. Join us today at nature.org slash New Mexico. minutes maybe just some framing for context for, for why, why we're here and what we're here to, to talk about. So I think the, the main question that we're, we're here to discuss is how we, will we live with fire as a necessary ecological disturbance and use it as a tool? Um, and the other part of the title here is future forests living with fire, right? So what do we mean by future forests? So it means a few things. I mean, even though we have a historical reference from a lot of science that shows us what forest used to look like, what the structure used to be, um, we know that there's a lot of changes to our forest between climate change, um, fire exclusion, past logging, you know, all sorts of things that have impacted um, our forest and have, have necessitated that we take some, some action. Um, the other bit about future forests is that as our forests burn and wildfires, um, we need to reforest them. So what does that look like if you're starting basically from scratch in a lot of places where you don't have the seed source and you can't rely on that nat natural successional processes to get our forest back? Um, and so how do we reforest our forest in the face of climate change and forests that look like the top center picture there in uh, the Hamas Mountains immediately post Los Conscious fire? And then, of course, the other bit of uh, important context to share is the Hermit's Peak Capitani wildfire that happened last year. Um, you know, we're going to talk about prescribed fire tonight. We're going to talk about it as, as a necessary tool. Um, and it's difficult. We have to hold these two truths in our hands. So there's uh, Hermit's Peak Cap Canyon caused by uh, prescribed fire that got out of control. Major disaster should never have happened. Um, but we also have to hold the truth that there's no future without fire. Um, we can't chip our way out of this. Uh, we can't masticate all of these acres. We have to rely on fire. Um, and I'll share some, some other reasons and data that, that support that, uh, that claim. 
So um, I'm going to present basically the same information in three different slides in three different ways. And the main thesis is that fire has always been here, fire always will be here, and we, we need fire. So I'm going to start with the, the science-based, evidence-based proof um, that we know that fire has always been here. And how do we know this? So I'm going to take uh, core samples. So the, the data you're looking at on the right side of the screen with all those little tick marks is from the Santa Fe uh, watershed. And so every line, I believe, is a tree, and every tick mark is a, a fire. So uh, fire scar results when fire impacts the tree, but the tree doesn't die. It continues to, to, to grow and live, and we can record that date all the way back to, I think I can't read uh, the dates on the tree cookie, but you know, back to the 1400s, 1500s. And so every tick there is a fire that impacted these particular trees, and you can see when you get to about 1900, the record just sort of stops, and that's when we started suppressing wildfires. Um, we you'll often hear people use the terms fire suppression and fire exclusion interchangeably. So fire exclusion, not necessarily suppression. Um, grazing animals have had the effect of excluding fire. You eat the grass, grass used to carry fire, nothing to carry fire, and now you get trees. That's you're excluding fire from the landscape. Logging can also exclude fire if you remove the fuel. Same same result. No no trees, no fire. Um, so you, the last hundred years, roughly, uh, we've got a, bi a big fire deficit that we're having to overcome. So the other way I want to present the data um, is visually with this map. So this is showing, um, Peter will explain the legend here, so we've got the Rio Grande Water Fund footprint, that's the, the blue outline. So the Rio Grande Water Fund um, initiative that we started in 2014 to get uh, downstream users to help pay for upstream forest restoration treatments. So this is all post-loss conscious, where uh, the city of Albuquerque had to shut down their surface water intake for 40-ish days because of the post-fire debris flows and things like that. So that's what the water fund is, what the, the boundary. We've also got the Carson National Forest, and the yellow are fire perimeters. And so all of this data came from Region 3 of the U.S. Forest Service. That's why the fire stopped at the New Mexico state line. Um, but when I see this, it's these are all the, the fire starts, and I'll dig into the data just a little bit finer to see what the difference between the human versus natural cause ignitions shows us. Um, but fires all around us, these are all lightning strikes, they're all escaped campfires. So even if all of these fires don't turn into a wildfire perimeter, it's just, I think, illustrative of we don't hear about all of these fire starts, but, but they're out there. So lightning will always be a thing, we'll always have, have fire. So this is from, it says 1970 to 2023, and 3,307 fires. So if you prefer your data in more uh, tabular form or, or chart form, because um, the last slide doesn't show us what was natural and what was human caused. So the vast majority are naturally caused wildfires by lightning mostly, so 65%. Um, and maybe I'll end with this uh, quote from Leopold, my sort of framing for uh, fire has always been here and there's no future without fire. So to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. So a fire here, or any, any kind of ecological disturbance, uh, cogs and wheels. And tinkering here, I thought about this uh, earlier, doesn't necessarily mean forest management, doesn't mean prescribed fire necessarily. Tinkering is building uh, infrastructure and homes in forested areas. Um, it's power lines running through forested areas. You know, there's all sorts of ways that we tinker with the relationship between forests and fire. And um, if we pull fire out of the system, we're, we've seen the negative effects, and now that's what we're, we're all trying to address. So that's the end of, oh, sorry, no, it's not. A little bit more context. So you might hear folks talk about all the funding that's available, and we've used the phrase meeting the moment. So when we say meet the moment, we mean Billions of dollars uh, in federal federal funding for forest restoration, watershed work, uh, risk reduction type work. Um, you know, if you go back ten years ago, ish, when the water fund was started, um, so if you see the red call out box there, twelve million dollars that first bullet in national forest system lands like across the entire state. Now, in the Enchanted Circle Party landscape, which we're in in Taos, eleven point three million over a few years. So really, all you need to know is that. Um, there's a lot of funding that's going to hit the ground soon. And so that's the other bit of context as we talk about increasing the pace and scale.
it's not theoretical that we're going to do this work and why it's important to have these community dialogues um, because the work will happen, we will scale up, so we're going to see more forestry work, more smoke in the air, and so now's the time to talk about what that means. A little bit more context, so I mentioned that we're a priority, the Enchanted Circle Priority Landscape, circled there on the map, but we're one of 20 plus priority landscapes all throughout the West and throughout the country. And so um, the way I understand these priority landscapes is they're the fastest, shortest path for those billions of dollars of forest restoration work. So that's, that's good for us in this area, that we have a priority landscape that we're gonna see work happen faster. Um, doesn't mean sloppy, but just, you know, we have the clock is ticking on addressing some of these issues. Uh, but we do have to compete for funding with uh, priority watersheds and projects all around on the West. Now that's the end of my bit. <laughs> so uh, the next bit of context is going to be shared by Rachel Foe. Um, so I asked Rachel to present uh, because she's the reforestation coordinator for the state of New Mexico uh, Forestry Division. So I've been to a lot of these talks sitting in the audience or participating where we frame the discussion only with the fire context. But I think it's important to share the reforestation angle because that's what's at stake. So that's the other bit of context. If we don't act, then we're going to have to do, uh, and we, we are in this moment now, have to do huge reforestation talks. So um, just to introduce Rachel, she began her career with the New Mexico Forestry Division as the prescribed fire coordinator in May of 2022. She now serves as the reforestation coordinator and is helping the New Mexico Forestry Division work with New Mexico Highlands University, New Mexico State University, and the University of New Mexico to develop the New Mexico Reforestation Center, which when it is built will have the capacity to grow 5 million seedlings per year, up from our current capacity of 300,000 seedlings per year. Wow. So we've got a big, uh, a big deficit to make up. And so, and with that, I'll as Matt said, my name is Rachel, and when I started with the Forestry Division, uh, things were looking kind of like this, the Hermit's Peak Cap Canyon fire, so I started off in crisis mode, helping with post-fire work and disaster recovery. So transitioning into this role, where I get to think about the future and our future forests and helping them come back to life, um, it feels really good. So this position, my position, has only been around since about January. So it's brand new, trying to address these new issues that we have in New Mexico. So I'm gonna talk about why we need reforestation. Um, kind of maybe set some more context behind the high severity wildfire and why that causes the need for reforestation. And then the reforestation pipeline and the challenges that we have with that, uh, but also the opportunities that we are um, kind of taking advantage of here in New Mexico. So many of us probably know this and Matt touched on this a little bit, but the factors increasing risk and severity of wildfire, we have them all. New Mexico and the, this picture sort of illustrates these two pictures maybe the top one is what our forests maybe should look like maybe what they have looked like in the past um, when fire was more around was around more and then these this picture on the bottom you can see what it looks like now and if you go hiking out in the woods um, you'll notice that it's, it's much more densely packed lots of these huge big ponderosa trees I wanted to show this for context. Um, this is the burn severity map of the Hermes Peak Cap Canyon fire. And we all know that that was a huge fire. We had a huge fire season in 2022. But what gets me even in this industry is, you know, I have been up to this spot in this burn scar called Johnson Mesa a couple times. And it's probably maybe right here. A little more um, specifically, but you go there and you you look around 360, and it's all burned, and you're like, "Wow, this is a big fire." But what what's so shocking is that you're in that just little spot, 
of the burn scar. And so it really gives context to the, the massive scale where you can hear the numbers like, oh yeah, a decade or more ago, a big fire used to be 4,000 acres. And now this is 350,000 acres. So it's, oh yeah, that sounds really big. But when you're in a space like this picture and you look 360 around and it's all gone, and that's just a small piece of what has been burned, you feel it a lot more. So this is picture is actually from the headwaters of the Gainas Creek burned by the Hermes Cap Canyon fire. And here we're not just talking about forests and seed and the loss of our forests, but also the loss of water. So this is the headwaters of the, um, the drinking water for almost all of Las Vegas, New Mexico. And right now they're, I don't know about right now, it's probably going to take a while, but FEMA is going to pay about $160 million to install a new water filtration system. So in terms of reforestation though, we have now these huge areas of land that no longer have any trees and the seed dispersal rate is about 200 feet. So these are not going to naturally regenerate on their own. Um, in the past, when we had 4,000 acre fires and spotty parts of trees, it could maybe come back. Now this will not come back unless we help it. Um, so in addition to that, we're losing our soil and like I mentioned, water. And then in some places where these huge landscapes burn, it's not even wise to um, replant trees because the vegetation type is gonna switch over. Um, so you have to look at the landscape and the climate and where is the right place to plant trees. And just to add on to that fact about water, 50% uh, to 75% of all water um, used by municipalities in agriculture in New Mexico comes from our forests. Um, <clears throat> Just another piece of context you can see here in the red, the incidence of wildfire cause need for reforestation has drastically gone up um, as our, our need or what we're doing to meet that need has gone down. So we have to be able to do better. Okay, so I set the context about why we need this um, and it all the, you know, it's, I'm going to transition further again into all the great things we're doing here in New Mexico to meet these challenges. But the challenges are pretty great. Uh, when I first learned about all this stuff, it's pretty shocking to recognize that one, we're in a seed crisis in this country, we don't have enough seed. And two, in order to get this seed, you have to have awesome tree climbers getting up in the tops of these 80 foot trees. And I just was at a training about a month ago, uh, Santa Clara Pueblo, Hammonds Pueblo, uh, New Mexico Highlands University. I got to go up 80 feet in a tree, it was pretty awesome. But it's not like you can just take this training and then you're like a tree climber. Um, I kind of maybe thought that, uh, pretty athletic. I thought I could do that, but no, it's, it's hard. And the people that were training us had been arborists before, they've been doing this for years. So to scale up this kind of a workforce, uh, it's going to take some work and some, some dedicated people. Um, so just to emphasize the fact that we're in the seed crisis, this is from American Forests. Um, 133 million acres are in need of reforestation across our whole country. Uh, that would take 3 billion seeds a year to reforest all that land. And to get even halfway there, current seed supplies to more than double to produce 34 billion seedlings. Of course, like remember that map of 350,000 acres of Hermes Peak Cap Canyon. We're not going to go in there and replant the whole thing. That's not feasible. Um, so we have to think about planting smart and planting in the right place. Um, we have some really good people here in Mexico working on that. We'll get to that in a second. So I mentioned one part of the reforestation pipeline, which is seed, and the challenges that we face there. Um, getting the workforce, collecting the seed, monitoring for the seed, 
Oh yeah, and then there's only like uh, a mass year every seven to 10 years and we don't know how to do that, or we don't know when to predict that. So that's another challenge. Um, but good news, there was a mass year this last year. So the Forest Service collected two to 3,000 bushels of cones across the whole region, which is really great. And we collected uh, 235 bushels, which is also good. So seed, we're working on that. Um, nursery, there's issues with having the right kind of staff, the right educated nursery managers, um, the facilities across the country are lacking. Um, Outplanting, how do you then take those baby trees to the sites, make sure they're like, you know, coddled along the way and the transport trucks that are refrigerated. They get to the site that is already prepared for you to plant. And then especially here in New Mexico, you have to have the right tools and you have to know where you're gonna plant and then some of the post-planting and the monitoring and all the workforce that that takes um, to go through. And then on top of all of that, um, it's so shocking to me that there's only this handful of universities that are doing research or any work in this space. Um, I think from what I've learned, this is because reforestation used to be done uh, post timber harvest and the Forest Service and other people weren't really predicting these huge massive fires that we have now and so reforestation maybe wasn't as big of a business as it is now and it's going to be. So I, I mentioned all the challenges and they are great so uh, but there's also some great opportunities and we're really working on them here in New Mexico. We're really lucky to have some of the top reforestation experts uh, in the country um, at our top universities. And in the New Mexico Forest Action Plan, we have a whole strategy that outlines all the pieces of that pipeline, how we're going to meet those challenges and how our partner institutions are going to help us do that. And as a team here, we are the reforestation center and we are built we're going to build a new facility that's going to help meet these challenges by growing farmland seedlings here um, so new mexico state is heavy on the nursery side of things um, new mexico highlands university is really working on the seed and the seed collection and processing and workforce development and then uh, university of new mexico is working hard on their climate, the climate modeling and figuring out where to plant the seedlings and where they need to go. Uh, we're also poised to build this new brand new facility with like the best technology and to do so to be a model for the rest of the West and even the nation. We're using some new technology like on the left here, you can see um, those uh, I don't know what they're called. Trays. <laughs> trays, thank you. Those trays are sitting in um, these, also lots of words right now, but basically they're being irrigated from the bottom. And in most nurseries, they're irrigated from the top, they're kind of sprayed on, and you lose a lot of water that way. This way we can, we can conserve our water. We're also um, kind of pioneering here in New Mexico like the best ways to plant. So uh, the density of trees, the tools that you need to plant and all of that. So we're getting that all worked out. We also have a lot of increase in federal funding. Um, the Forest Service has been a great partner with this reforestation center. Um, they're helping us uh, and they have a mandate to do so through the Replant Act. Um, they're also kind of working with tribes and other states. And not, it's not just us in New Mexico, other states like Colorado and Washington are also scaling up their production. <laughs> so reforestation is really exciting. There's a lot of uh, positive things happening here in New Mexico, but if we can keep our forests green um, to the extent possible, uh, that's really what we need to do. We know there's gonna be fire, there's gonna be more fires. That's why we're here to, to reforest but um, keeping our forest green through 
tools like prescribed fire is going to be really important for our future too. So that's it. Thank you. So we have just a few minutes for maybe like one or two questions for Rachel. Um, so, forgive me, I'm listening to myself. Uh, uh, so the state, you work for the state, and the state is going to reforest federal land that was burned? It's tricky. We are, we are partnering with these universities to grow the seedlings. And then we're going to be working like all the other forest work that we do through the state, through contracts and agreements. We do work with the Forest Service. We do work with private landowners. Um, so for example, the Forest Service just replanted a section um, in Hermes Peak Cap Canyon Burn Scar this fall, and we grew 3,000 of those seedlings at the facility and more. So yeah, we're helping them grow them, even though for that project, the Forest Service kind of contracted their plant and did all, all that stuff on their own. Why are there prescribed burns during the winter season? <clears throat> I will let some of the um, <laughs> She's deforestation expert. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Save that for a few minutes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, maybe two more. Um, two questions. Uh, how long does it take to create a viable seedling? And then what is the se success rate of creating a seedling? Um, you can help me out here, but I think it's about nine months? No, ten? Six, okay. six to seven months. Okay. Oh, the okay. director of the uh, reforestation center in Mora. Thanks, Owen. Okay, so you have to put your order in. Sure. And success rates on average are about 25% for operational practices, but really with the work we're doing, we're getting our numbers up to about 75%. Cool. But that's research practice. <laughs> Also, I just want to put these ground rules. This is fairly typical for any kind of facilitated discussion to have ground rules. Um, so I'll just go through these really quick. Be respectful. I feel like that's fairly straightforward and um, everyone can, can get behind that. Uh, challenge ideas, not people. Like we're all here in good faith. We recognize the challenges. We recognize the, the issues and things that have happened in the very recent past. Um, so yeah, challenge ideas, not people. Make space for other voices in the room. So we're going to give this at least till um, seven. We're going to give it an hour. Um, but yeah, we want to make sure we have plenty of time for, for lots of folks to ask questions. Uh, listen with an open mind. Uh, be concise. Really, just gets back to the making space for other folks who want to have a, a good discussion. Uh, agree to have unfinished conversations. So someone you might ask a question. Someone might give an answer. You might have a follow up, or the answer might be unsatisfactory but we're gonna to have to just sort of move on likely and you know, maybe grab that person after the, the event and grab their contact info if you'd like to have a, um, a longer conversation. 
um, and seek common ground. So you know, even if we don't reach um, consensus over what there might be divergent views in the room, we can at least seek to understand, okay, well, I see where you're coming from, even if I don't agree with you. So um, I'll leave those up uh, if we're okay with high line. Is the projector okay for you guys? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, let's see here. So I'm gonna start with one question for everybody. But first I wanna do the, the intros just to, to so everyone knows who we've got sitting up in front. So Mary Stuber, hi Mary, is uh, served as the Chama District Forester for over 12 years before taking over as the District Forester for Cimarron. She's worked in forestry for diverse employers and as a private consultant for over 40 years. Mary's key focus is on fostering healthy and resilient forests as well as communities that support and are supported by sustainable forest activities. We also have Renee Romero at the end. Uh, as a native son of northern New Mexico who has played extensively in fire, his connection to nature is based on nature know best, knows best. Uh, Renee has completed 16 years as a smoke jumper and 27 years as a professional ski patroller at Taos Ski Valley. He is currently working for his home tribe, Taos Pueblo, as a forestry fuels coordinator since 2007 to present. And his current focus in life and fire is we can do better. J.R. Logan is the Forest and Watershed Health Manager for Taos County. JR founded Del Medio Forestry LLC to help grow the Taos County restoration economy. His understanding of forest partnerships, uh, forest restoration, nonprofit management, and keen sense of the value of strong community partnerships will help us better address workforce issues, create opportunities for sustainable jobs, and strengthen the invaluable partnerships that are key to increasing the pace, scale, and quality of forest restoration. And last but not least, uh, Brent Davidson is the Fuels and Fire Staff Officer on the Carson National Forest. Brent worked on interagency hotshot crews on the Coconino National Forest for 12 years, among other positions with the Forest Service. Uh, his wife, two kids, and family dog have called Taos home since 2018 and are proud to be part of this wonderful community. So thank you all for, for participating. Um, so again, I'll ask one question that everybody will answer and then we'll open it up for, for questions from the audience. So that question is, what does living with fire mean to you? Volunteers, or I'm going to call somebody out? You're going to have to call us out. All right, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. All right. I, I've thought about this because Matt told us a couple weeks ago he'd be asking this question. And what it comes down to me that living with fire is a subset of living with climate change. It's a subset of living in the world today. And I think the key thing is that we, as a society, are going to need to adjust in a lot of different ways. And one of those things is the way we think about problems. And I think if we continue thinking about, is this working any better? If we continue thinking about problems the way we've been thinking about them, that's the kind of thinking that got us into this situation. And that's the linear kind of thinking. There's a problem, here's a solution, let's implement it. Um, I think what we have to do now is really consider the whole system, thinking about all the unintended consequences, bringing more and more voices to the table so that we really understand the deepness and the complexity of what we're facing and that we our approaches are approaches that are community-wide that are using a lot of adaptation as we go along and that are recognizing the complexity of what we're up against and so when I think about us living with fire I think about us acknowledging how complex it is to put prescribed fire on the ground and how that's just a part of what a healthy forest is. It's thinking about reforestation in terms of, you know, why are we reforesting? What a great question. I love that because we want to really be able to think deep about each part of, of what we're doing and how we're participating. And I love Rachel's answer. Um, and so I'm pretty excited about the future because I'm really deeply engaged in a lot of collaboratives and a lot of opportunity to really work with people, to work with communities, and to have, I, I get so inspired 
by us all working together. And I think that we are on the right trajectory to change the forest environment around us so that when fires are burning, those fires are burning in a way that is not threatening to our communities and forests, but are actually doing that beneficial work that fire was doing for the hundreds of thousands of years before our, our European mindset um, entered this landscape. And so I think we are going to have an American mindset that really goes back to incorporating um, traditional ecological knowledge, incorporating the way communities feel. So that's me. Does that mean I have to go next? Yeah. <laughs> you did such a good job, though, man. Um, in a lot of ways, my answer is similar to Mary's. I think in some ways it's divergent. I, I think learning to live with fire is learning to accept that we can't control nature in the ways that we thought we could in the past. And last year's fire is a perfect example of it. I think the increasing prevalence of mega fires and post fire effects are obvious examples of that. And to be perfectly blunt, I work in this and I care very deeply about it, but more and more, I'm skeptical of our ability to accomplish the things that we think we're gonna be able to accomplish. Regardless of that mountain of money that Matt put up on the screen, our systems, our human systems, may not be able to rise to that challenge. We're gonna do our damnedest to focus on the places where we think we can make an effect using the best of modern science and the best traditional knowledge. But the truth is things are gonna change, they're already changing, and we're gonna to have to collectively learn to accept that. Usually when I say that, the, the, the consequence of that that seems obvious is fatalism. Throw your hands up and say, well, screw it. We're all, we're all doomed anyways. We might as well, when Colin Happy needs to send, it's gonna go sell, sell insurance and I will you on the pool. <laughs> Um, I, I think that that stroke, that step to fatalism is misguided because changes like what we saw on those slides, the scary images of a guy in his watershed completely nuked out, the fact that now the city of Las Vegas needs $160 million just to keep the taps flowing, they're really scary. They're really scary images and we don't adjust well to change. But this question of what does living with fire mean, it means coming to terms, I think, as a society, that that change is inevitable and accepting that inevitability, but then rising to the occasion, as Mary mentioned, to do our best to adapt to that. I think the other thing that gets baked into that question of living with fire, it's a loaded question. It, it presumes that all of us agree that fire has played a natural role in this ecosystem since time immemorial, and that we all just need to get on board with the fact that things like prescribed fire, things like thinning, are just the right thing to do, and you better get on the train. I feel that way very strongly, but I also appreciate the fact that not everybody feels that way. My day-to-day -day is usually spent overseeing thinning projects, sometimes on Forest Service land, often on private land, and a good bit of my time is spent working with people who live on or around those properties who are really pissed off about what they're seeing. They don't like to see trees cut down, they sure as hell don't want to see fire happen, and it looks after these projects like we've destroyed something, like we've taken a forest that was pristine and beautiful and untouched and we ruined it. And I can appreciate that position, but I can also hopefully convey to folks that part of our process of adapting to be being more able to live with fire means having some humility about what the timeline for a forest and ecosystem is and put that into perspective of our very limited human timelines. I think about this when I was driving in today and you can still see yellow on the aspens up in the high slopes, you know, halfway up the mountain where the oak transitions into aspen. And this year has been particularly phenomenal for the colors. The, that beauty that we enjoy, Ray, I think back to our conversation when you took me out in the Forest Service truck, that's fire. Fire did that. Fire 
did something that looked ugly right at that moment, and then it created a masking stand that we all enjoyed. And so these systems are complicated, and the timeline for how they recover and what it's going to look like in the future is going to well outlive us. But I think my hope is that more conversations like these, more really honest conversations like these, that are not patronizing to folks who disagree with what we might be doing or condescending to folks who just haven't studied it, is going to help us get to a place where even if we disagree about how we get there, we can appreciate that all of us want to want the same outcome. And like it or not, things are changing. And, and building those relationships, in my opinion, is as important as getting the work done to hopefully mitigate the effects of that. I hope I don't have to follow JR all night long. <laughs> um, like Mary mentioned, we got this question uh, a couple weeks ago from Matt. At first, I was like, oh, this is a pretty easy question. It's something to wrap my head around and get this going and, and you know, knock the nerves off of whatever in front of an audience. But uh, the more I thought about it, the closer this night came, it's a pretty complicated question, even, even to me, where um, I've spent you know, 20 plus years of, of my life uh, probably imbalanced dealing with fire versus the other things that I do in my life. Um, but it's, it's very complicated. Um, and I, and I think it's more complicated today than it was 23 years ago because of just where we're at um, in the world and society and, and with our ecosystems and, and climate change and whatever whatever your viewpoint is, but it's, it's definitely more complex and I think we can all agree with that. Um, first off, um, what, what I came up with is that we don't have a choice to live with fire or not. If we're gonna live in the, these landscapes and in more and more landscapes across the world, this is a reality. Um, I didn't think about this until maybe an hour or two before I got here, but this, this summer I went on a wildland fire assignment to Quebec, northern Quebec, Canada, uh, to, to the fires that were happening there. And I think that's pretty relevant to our discussion tonight because um, you know that was that's just not something in any history has ever burned like that. Um, and and uh, to go experience something like that and come home and apply, uh, you know, some of the things that happened, some of those experiences back to, to where we're at, where we're managing managing fire, managing the forest, I think it was, it's a little bit eye-opening. Uh, it, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing that it just happens more and more frequently or traveling somewhere to deal with fire incidences that are happening in places where they don't. So, so that's the, the main thing is, is we don't really have a choice. We have to figure out collectively how we're gonna, how we're gonna live with fire. Um, and, and I like how, how JR and Mary framed it that, uh, you know, uh, people have different viewpoints and that's okay. Um, we're all gonna have to get to some sort of middle ground with how we, how we're gonna move forward with, with some of these decisions and um, impacts to, to our communities and, and to people that are recreating and living around, around these areas because there are gonna be impacts with, uh, with all levels of management of, of the ecosystems and of, of fire, whether it's the worst case, case scenario, wildfire uh, and devastation that comes with that, with watersheds and, and uh, people's homes and uh, smoke impacts and all that, uh, to, the, to the, you know, the other side of fire where it's a prescribed fire or a natural ignition that we're using to benefit the ecosystems, there's still gonna be impacts for, for everybody that lives around here in some fashion. Um, so I think realizing that and being upfront with that and honest with each other about uh, our opinions, um, the impacts that may be uh, outcomes of how we're, how we're managing the landscape and being very transparent with that is very important. So I think uh, a living mode for all of us is just gonna be continued conversations and realizing that there's gonna be inconveniences one way or another uh, with, with the management of the landscape and with fire uh, in all ranges. Uh, the other thing that I, I think about quite a bit is just being adaptable. Um, you know, things aren't the same. I've mentioned that already, but even five years ago, things aren't the same. Things change, we have to be very opportunistic about um, opportunities that we have for restoration, for, for the use of fire. Uh, and, and it may not be our historic norms that we've, we've done it for the past. It may not be late fall, early spring, things like that. Uh, it may be we don't have a monsoon season or we have a different rain pattern that's late and early and we have to take advantage of those opportunities when conditions are right, just based off of, of the conditions themselves. And so I think being adaptable um, to, to what's happening in our, in our world, in our environment, our landscape is gonna be very key to Hey, thanks.
Thank you, everybody. I know nothing. And all I can say is I watch and I listen. And nature tells me what needs to happen. So I'll start out with that because I want to cover a few things here. And I'll start out with saying, um, Taos, this is home. And you're here, this is your homeland now. And it's about taking care of this homeland. So it's about giving the best that we can to what we know is coming at us. But I start out by saying one thing, and I, most of you are in this room, look, I, I, I know by name, and I know you, and you've heard me say this before, but fire is the greatest gift that has ever been given to indigenous people. Now, when I use the word indigenous, I say, it's not just talking about the Native American, it's talking about all peoples. We were all indigenous. We lived on the land. We watched nature. We knew when to do things. We were when to plant, when to burn, when to celebrate. But we've lost that connection because we push a button now and we get everything that we need to to, to know and, th and think that's that's information. But it's patience. It's really appreciating the fact that this greatest gift can be either your best friend or it can be a raging inferno coming at you. And I'm going to tell you, you can't stop nature. We weren't able to stop the Hermit Peak Cap Canyon fire. You look at the flooding that comes in the aftermath, and we can't stop that either. Nature's way stronger than we are. So it brings me to another topic that I want to bring up, wilderness. We're surrounded by wilderness in Taos County. Now, what does the word wilderness mean to you? When I say, what does, define it, tell me what it means. There's about 30 people in this room today, and I bet you we have at least 25 different definitions of wilderness. Across the board, agencies, people have a different definition of wilderness. So how do we deal with it? Now, Taos Pueblo sits at a unique place. Recently, uh, we had a workshop, and one of the most productive workshops I've ever been to. It's called Prescribed Fire and, and U.S. Wilderness. And I say, who put it on? Who put it together? Well, they say on the top of this cover page, it says, Aldo Leopold Wilderness, cool. Rocky Mountain Research Station, cool. USDA, USDA Forest Service, very cool. But I'm gonna tell you, it was practitioners, people who loved their job and came across from all the federal agencies, and we came together and we said, hey, the Wilderness Act is, is a beautiful piece of work, but it doesn't say we defined it first. It doesn't say that we cannot work within it. And I'm going to say trammel versus untrammel. What does that mean? Because right now, climate change has already said we've already impacted that wilderness to a point no return. So it's trauma. Now in the case of Taos Pueblo, our wilderness and our drainages sit above the town of Taos and the World Heritage Site. The fire will last a few months maybe if we have a high severity fire and we'll put it out. But the post fire effects, they're gonna be devastating. They're gonna destroy maybe a portion of maybe knock down a World Heritage Site. The infrastructure of Taos is going to be affected. 
I recently visited Santa Clara, and most of you don't know, but I'm half Santa Clara. And I went up into those mountains. I've seen a lot of fire in my day, and I had to choke back tears and hide my tears because I visited these places. I knew these places. It was my homeland. And it made a significant impact to me that we can do better. That everybody can do better at addressing fire. So I think I've over, over, overextended my five minutes, but what can I say? Um, lastly, what I want to say about fire is, is one thing. It's the greatest gift that we've gone, but we've been taught to fear it. We're never going to learn to deal with it unless we learn to embrace fire. Coming from a point of fear is not the way to handle it. So, what does that mean? That means that all the agencies have to become teachers. They have to use their knowledge, their expertise, their resources, and they have to start teaching. And that's how we get a head start on that, on bringing balance back. Thank you. Good day, all for you. <laughs> two, or, two really quick uh, reflections on some of the things we heard. Um, building off what JR said, I think the, the maddening, but also hopeful thing is that um, we can solve these problems. We do know what, we know what caused them. We know what the solutions are. You, know, you can do anything poorly, but we're not curing cancer. We're not trying to create cold fusion. We know what, what the solutions are, but a mountain of money is no guarantee for success. We could have all the money in the world and we still wouldn't necessarily get there if we don't solve some of the other challenges that, are, that have been holding us back. And we're about to see if we have a mountain of money, how fast and, and well we can do this. Um, Brett, you mentioned uh, doing things differently in the future with shifting weather patterns. I think that is key. Um, wind is different now. Uh, monsoonal patterns are different. Burn windows in general are shifting. And so we got smacked in the face with it last year. That's going to be something, a big part of the conversation moving forward. And then, uh, you know, it's a very simple thing, but we can do better. <laughs> or, you know, what Renee said, uh, certainly in terms of having a mountain of money, but what are we going to do with that mountain of money? How are we going to put it? So with that, we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Um, soil science question. So after Mount St. Helens blew up, the next year there were plants growing again. And the plant successions set in and the land recovered in a relatively short period of course, the volcanic ash fertilized that soil. That doesn't happen here. But I guess my question to you from a science standpoint is when you get a hot fire, what does it do to the seed bank and the soil? What does it do to the mycelium? And how does it affect a normal follow-on plant succession? Any takers? I, I'm going to grab the mic. I had the honor and opportunity to work with the White Mountain Apache tribe for five years in post-fire um, recovery after the Rodeo and Chatted Sky Fire. And I think there are several things going on and I think it's very complex. And, and I don't want to simplify the answer to your question. Um, but one of the things that has happened is the legacy of fire exclusion has left us with so much fuel in the forest that when fires are burning, they are burning so much hotter and outside that range of what fire normally gets. So for example, on the Rodeo Chetta Sky Fire, we had observations of flame leaks that were going 2,000 feet up into the air. 
that's not a natural type of fiber and the heat is so much. So one of the wonderful things about fire is it's pretty chaotic and we get different results in different parts of the watershed and the burn. Um, there are places where we do lose the seed bank. There are lots of places where that seed bank is really vital and can come right up. Um, I think we tend to underestimate what we have out there in terms of natural seed source. Um, and maybe we will reseed areas that maybe didn't need to be reseeded because the natural seed bank was there, but also there are places where we did need to reseed. And it isn't really black and white of how much is there. It's not very obvious. So yeah, sometimes I think we might overestimate when we go out and reseed in terms of what normally is picked up. I think we kind of overestimate um, in, in, in some people's minds the hydrophilic soils, the soils that are so damaged that water just repels off of them that we give people the impression that it's everywhere and it lasts forever. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, we do see the hydrophilic response, but it's not all over the place. And it's, it's something that um, I, I feel like working in burned areas that they're very exciting places to be ecologically. The grasses do come back, wildflowers do come back. We see a lot of bird activity um, we may not be seeing the trees coming back because there's no seed source for, you know, I, I did some calculations on Rodeo Chetis Guy that with that 200 feet movement, you know, and how long it takes for a tree to get mature enough to produce cone, um, we would not see natural regeneration in many parts of that burn for 8,000 years wow. if we weren't replanting. So, um, you know, I, I feel like our big job when we're working in these burned areas is to really pay attention to Mother Nature and take her cues. But my big focus when I'm working in a burned area is to do things to try to keep that soil on the slope and that that soil is our biggest gift. Um, well, the fire is our biggest gift, I heard that. But um, <laughs> soil is our second biggest gift. And, um, it's, um, you know, one of the studies that I saw in the Sandia Mountains and four soils was estimating that it takes about 10,000 years to produce one inch of soil. So if we lose eight inches of soil and go down to cobble on a, what was a forested slope in a 30 minute monsoon rainstorm, we have just lost 80,000 years of soil building. Um, part of the reason that I feel very comfortable saying we haven't seen this kind of fire on our landscape before, even though we don't have records of what's been going on, is because we have the soil there and it didn't wash off 10,000 years ago. You know, it, it, it's still been there and now we're losing it. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, it does. I, I mean, basically, it is what it is. Some soil banks don't burn and sterilize and some do. And it'll take you a few years to figure out that, right? Yes. Next question. We had one up there first and I'll come down to you, sir. Okay. Uh, I want to see if we can draw JR out a little more. Um, I understood in the introduction that you work with the restoration economy. Uh, now that may be what I heard and not what was said, but you said you work with thinning crews. And I think of restoration economy as being kind of broad. It could be broad. So, you know, thinning, planting, prescribed fire, taking plots to, to follow things. Um, is, is, can one crew do all that? Is that separate crews? Is the workforce developed enough to be able to do all that? Or do you have different crews that do those things all year round? With your experience, talk about that a little bit more. And, and do we have the people to be able to do that? 
Oh my God. Yes, 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 no, yes, no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You're a lot of great peace, Chair. Well, that really yeah. goes well. I, I like all of those questions. Um, I do, so by virtue of the fact that I'm at the county level, almost as the middleman between the federal agencies, the state agencies, the tribes, and then the local communities, conversations and being involved in the restoration economy, especially the local one, is almost a de facto responsibility of mine, in my opinion. Simply because, as, as was shown in the context presentations at the beginning, yet, there's a preponderance of evidence that says this is the right thing to do, there's the motivation, and now funding is no longer the limiting factor. People have been throwing the words restoration economy around, especially in northern New Mexico, for decades. Um, what that actually looks like right now is, is quite thin compared to what you would hope it would be. Generally speaking, if, if we were to just draw the line of Taos County and say how many people are employed in the quote-unquote restoration economy as it relates to forestry, we're well under 100 right now, probably more than around 50. Um, and almost all of those people are employed on thinning crews. I'm looking at one of them right now, who's also got two other jobs. Is that right? At least that many, yeah. <laughs> um, and part of the challenge in maintaining a crew in Taos County is that northern New Mexico is just notoriously challenging to find a consistent workforce that's not unique to this industry. Another challenge is this is an expensive place to live, especially if you're on this side of the Sangres. And even if you walk onto a thinning crew making 20 bucks an hour, which is a cherry little job, that might not be enough to pay rent in this community. And perhaps most challengingly for the contractors who are trying to make a go of doing this work, not because it's a good way, good way to get rich, but because they actually care about the work, historically has been consistency in that work. You might, you might be able to piece together a few small jobs around people's homes. Those pay really well, but they're inconsistent. And you might be able to take on 20 or 30 acres on national forest lands. We're, we're working out the mechanisms to do that, to have thinning crews specifically doing that, because that's the low hanging fruit. But when those jobs end, even if you have to lay a crew off for five days between that job and the next job, folks can't afford to wait and hope that the next job is gonna pop up next week. Or folks might get distracted and start taking on recreational activities that aren't particularly productive and make it hard to come back to work. And I'm being a little tongue in cheek there, but that is a major, major problem that a lot of folks who are running these crews face. So I'm down to the third question, Our fourth, are there enough people to do this work here with, let's call it the region, northern New Mexico? Absolutely. And more importantly, I think one of the advantages we have is we continue to have a local population, especially of folks who would much rather be in the woods, cutting trees, burning piles, re replanting, doing stand exams, doing all of the things it takes to accomplish this work. They would so much rather be doing that than waiting tables and cleaning hotel rooms or answering phones up at the ski area. It's work that matters to them. They have a real kinship and a connection with the landscape and there's so much pride in the work. I think to get, to get past where we're at right now, the status quo being contractors living hand to mouth and contracting crews hoping that there's gonna be work next week so that they can pay the rent or keep the water on, um, is gonna require a, a monumental effort of the folks who wear uniforms. And I'm gonna put myself into that category, the people pushing paper. Um, and it's gonna require some creativity on all of our parts to get outside of, think outside of the box in terms of this is the way we've always done it, so this is the way we have to do it going forward. I'm particularly encouraged by the fact that New Mexico is leading the charge on reforestation because not only is, is that geographically relevant to Taos County and to this area, and the fact that we've got now this massive burn scar on the east side of the mountain and are almost certain to have more burn scars in the near future, but the folks as I described in my intro, the folks who are really just opposed or offended by the idea of cutting trees also tend to be the folks who are so 
enamored with and passionate about replanting areas where we, we could have or should have or want to have forests. And so there's kind of space for everybody at that table in a way. And it helps somebody like me who is is guilty of that myopia of the restoration industry is thinning contractors start to expand our horizons. And then I know I've gone on, but Kent, the, la the last question you asked is, are there crews that do all of it? There damn well should be, but there aren't really in Northern New Mexico yet. Um, but I think cross training to have a contractor that can come in, do a thinning job, when the season is right, when the timing is right, maybe come back and be qualified to burn those piles to help somebody like Brent out if his resources are elsewhere. Or if we have a fire, they can get called up as a resource and make really good money as a local resource responding to the suppression activities and then roll in after the fire and do some of that post-fire rehab. A one-stop shop is not, it, it's the smartest business move, but it's complicated at this point. And I'll be, I'm hopeful that somebody can put those pieces together, but I don't know if it will actually happen. Thank you. Gentleman in the front. Thank you for the opportunity to ask this. I want to direct my question principally to Brent. Um, Brent, you, you've only been in New Mexico for a few years, so there's no reason why you should have all the answers to, to questions like the one I'm going to ask. But, um, you know, the Carson had a very robust seedling planting program here on the Carson about 40 years ago. There's crews all over the place planting seedlings. I, I know this because um, I started working for the Carson in the spring of 1959. That dates me. I know. Uh, I worked for about five years for the Carson. And I always stayed in the woods one way or another. So um, when I go into the woods now, when I go up to Harita Mesa to look at the wild ponies, or I go looking for my Christmas tree, or I go steal the tulapias, you know, um, I keep looking for these stands of all those trees that were planted back then. I haven't found one yet. So my question is, I'm very curious as to whether the Forest Service is learning from its mistakes, because I think back then they planted a lot of trees and not one of those trees is standing out there providing a cone for a squirrel, you know? So there's, that's just one example of the, the, the mistakes that the Forest Service has made in Northern New Mexico since 1909, when it was upwards of 100 years. And I don't know that the, or, that the agency has ever had a conference or a symposium or even a luncheon to discuss the mistakes of the past. And I think we all know that how we learn is by, you know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we beat the hell out of ourselves for the mistakes, but we need to learn from our mistakes. And if you get back to the Carson tomorrow to the office, and somewhere you find records of all where all those trees were planted, please let me know because I'd like to see those in my book. Thank you. Um, you're right, I don't have answers to, to that specific question. Um, uh, you know, the, the trees that were planted and where they at, what happened with them and such. Um, I sure hope we've learned from our mistakes. I feel like we have. I feel like uh, a lot of the, uh, the culture of the Forest Service in the past was to keep everything kind of internal. And, uh, and uh, at this point, you know, we want to talk to all the people, talk to the partners, work with everybody, and be a lot more open and upfront. Um, and I think that's a big culture shift that's even happened in my, in my career. Um, so I certainly hope that we're learning from our mistakes. 
I think this fire discussion is, is an example of that. You know, we, we realize that the suppression of fire over a long, long time has got us to a place where we shouldn't be. And um, so I think that's also an example of our learning. So hopefully we're learning and, and certainly want to continue to learn and change. Um, just it, kind of relevant to your to your story there, um, working on a hotshot crew in, in, in Flagstaff, Arizona, um, we had an assignment just you know between fires to go and uh, do meadow restoration. So there were a bunch of trees that were encroaching on a meadow, uh, or a bunch of meadows. And uh, so our superintendent took us out there to go and cut those trees. And he was actually on the planting crew that planted those trees, uh, you know, 25 years before, or 15 years before, or a long time. Anyway, so they planted the trees, then we went and cut them down. The trees weren't growing, they were planted in meadows. It's not what the trees were supposed to grow. So um, I certainly hope we're learning. Um, and, 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 you know, it's all about being open and, and having honest discussions, I think. Um, and then just for clarification, I, I don't know, it's important to me, but I'm actually from New Mexico. Um, I left here and moved and worked other places, and I've been in Taos for about five years, but uh, yeah, I came back home eventually. <laughs> this is a good time to make a plug for the Reforestation Center that, that Rachel talked about. So <clears throat> I've been a part of planning projects, mostly from behind a desk, but, uh, you know, Planting trees is more than just a hole in the ground, I think is probably witnessed by not seeing the trees that were planted. And so like anything else, you can you can do it poorly. And moving forward, it's not only learning from the past of how did we plant trees and it didn't work in 1959, but it's certainly not gonna work with climate change and with planting in a fire scar that, you know, if you look at that top picture, do you see any conifers in that picture? No, that's not a very conducive place to plant a tree necessarily. So. Um, that is a, a key question that folks are working on, the Reforestation Center and, and the various universities. But um, if we move forward with planting trees and just sticking them a hole in the ground and not you know, considering some other factors that we take care of those trees to get 25% plus uh, success rates, then we're, we're in trouble. So it's a very important question. Yeah, I, I would like to take you in the woods, Louise, because I've been in New Mexico. Well, you can take Exactly. Um, some of the places that, you know, I know where those trees have been planted, they're doing kind of well. I know they've been planted because there have been some mistakes. I'll be walking along and I'm in a stand and they're pretty good trees. You might not think that they were planted. And then there's a lodgepole pine. And, um, you know, that was stuck in there with the mess of Ponderosa that got sent down from the nursery in um, Colorado. So we've got them out there. There's a lot of they, they felt they had a reforestation backlog um, in the mid-70s. They created the, the nursery um, down in Albuquerque. They planted millions and millions of trees. Um, one of the things that they had in their advantage is that a lot of these trees got planted in the 1980s, and it was really wet then. And so they set the bar for getting 85 95% survival, um, which we don't get when we're in these burn areas and things like that. Um, and then we're told we're being um, not successful because we're getting 40% survival because back in the 80s, they could get 85% survival. So um, I do think there's a lot of trees out on the landscape left from that. And I do think a lot of them got planted because there was so much pressure to plant trees. They got put in places they shouldn't have been put in a few cases. And so we did go back to Meadows and try to cut them out because, and I think one of the things I'm really proud of to, with today's reforestation effort is the huge conversations, the research that UNM is doing to ensure that we're putting the right tree in the right place. And so we're not only talking about how to grow the fattest, you know, tallest seedling in the greenhouse. We're talking about how to grow a seedling in the greenhouse that's drought resistant. And we're not talking about putting trees out in the forest willy nilly. We're put, talking about how to pick the right microsite for that tree to have the best survival. We're talking about planting the seed trees of the future instead of trying to plant, you know, 800 acres all contiguous. Let's go out and plant places so that instead of it taking 8,000 years for the area to get reforested with the seed trees out there, maybe it only takes a thousand. Um, you know, so there's, I think, some really good conversations going on around reforestation. I'm really excited about 
reforestation, but I hope we can get out into our forest that hasn't created a reforestation problem and get the resiliency in that forest so that we don't have to replant it. So we had a question up here. Yeah. Uh, my name is Steve Chavez, and I'm a seventh generation New Mexican. You know, very proud. Both sides of my family have been to New Mexico forever. And I own a few companies from Albuquerque to Taos. And my passion is the woods. It always has been foraging, you name it, hunting, fishing. Uh, in 2006, I had a landscaping company and we proposed thinning projects. I had crews, I had chainsaws, I had able bodies. And the Forest Service said, there's no way. Too much insurance, too much gas, too much, you're never gonna find enough labor, blah, blah, blah. So I'm liking today and thank you for showing up, you know, how do you eat an elephant? one bite at a time, right? And we all have to take our bite. So I'm hoping, I'm putting myself out there, I have uh, my contact information here and just a small plan of what that outline was, and I'm sure you have the textbook for it already. There are people, I talked to my brothers, all my carnales in the mountains are ready to get to work. And they're not afraid of fire, they're not afraid of cutting down trees. They want jobs and they want to show up. But the thing is, is that with this $160 million mountain of money, my question is, is it going to be thrown away on projects that are not actually going to benefit the next 50, 100, 200 years? The 500 year plan is great. You know, the earth, she'll take care of herself. We want the trees, we want to see the beautiful forest back, but the honest truth is, in 500 to 1,000 years, we will be long gone and the forest will be just fine. Right? Right. We need people who will fund us, you know, have, get us, can this $160 million be put to support those manetos that are ready to go out and cut the wood? Because as it's you know, then so far we put it on our own dime and we also have to buy the permits for the wood. So something to consider, we have a lot of Norteños out here that will do the work, but we're not gonna go run our trucks into the ground and our bodies into the ground for free. You know? So what is the plan for the, the money as far as that goes? And I'll just say that there's a lot of conversations happening about workforce stuff that I've had with JR, I've had with Brent. Um, there's a lot of what you're alluding to. I mean, the, all those millions of dollars want to see go to local contractors. I'll let the, the other folks speak, but um, yeah, why not work with, with local folks? That's There's a lot of conversations and energy behind that. But. Steve, thanks for coming and thanks for laying that out. Rather than repeat a lot of what I said to Ken. I think, suffice to say, you and I need to chat yeah, because yeah. you're exactly the kind of guy I'm looking for. Sure. And you and your Kandanes are exactly the kind of people we're looking for. It, your story, though, is, is a nice bridge between Luis's point, um, Brent's response, and a lot that I think we're either taking head on right now or tiptoeing around, which, and I'll preface this by saying, most of my best friends work for the Forest Service. I hate the Forest Service. I hate it. I hate it deeply with with every ounce of my body. As a bureaucracy, it is impossible to work with. And the best people who work for the forest hate it just about as much as I do. But they stick with it because they recognize that it is the devil that we have, it's the devil we know, and it's the devil we need to work with. Your story from 2006 doesn't surprise me at all. In fact, Luis's story of going back to 1959 where Tree planting may or may not have been done very well, or if it was done well, where are the results from that? Do we learn from our mistakes? I, I feel really strongly that we as a community need to, need to step up, as you're describing, and move past the paradigm where we point our finger at the Forest Service and tell them all the things that they have done wrong in the past and that they continue to do wrong now. And I say that not because I want them to dodge accountability, but because 
as an agency, people come and go through positions. They might get detailed out, detailed in, whatever. It's that it's a it's a revolving door of faces at that agency. But there are really good, really smart people who work for that agency. But the legacy of the Forest Service of Northern New Mexico is one of uh, patronizing and exclusion and ostracization of locals from their forests. It's part of the reason we have the best in Northern New Mexico that we have. But to Brent's point, and I can vouch for it, again, as somebody who's a card-carrying hater of the Forest Service, they're, they culturally have gone through a monumental shift, not just in the way they do their day-to-day -day business, but in the way they talk to people, the way that they work with people like me, work with Renee, work with Mary, work with a lot of people in this room. Hell, the fact that Brent is sitting up here in a Forest Service uniform and doesn't have to be, wouldn't have happened in 2006. It's, it's just not a thing. So there, there is a recognition that there's a middle ground that we all need to come to where the agency has let down its guard. They are, we are being more creative in how we can put more locals like you, Steve, to work in the woods. And now it opens the door for more people from this community to, to at least for the moment, bury a lot of the resentment and hatred that they might, they might carry towards that agency and step up in good faith to be able to get this work done for all of our collective benefit in the short term. Well, that happens through empowerment. You're damn right it does. I'm gonna go to the mini event the happiness. <laughs> well, first of all, I just wanna thank all of you and the Conservancy for just putting all of this on because these conversations have been going on for a very, very long time. Jared and I have talked on a couple of different occasions. Um, and I guess of all the questions that I would love to ask is as a passionate gardener and educator of young ones and lover of the forest, um, growing up in the forest, I would love to know whether or not there is a a part of this reforestation that incorporates you know, mycelium and other seedlings, germinating you know, other species of things, so that when we're putting together um, a plan that the community can also be a part of, um, you know, as he was just discussing, having crews that are ready to do the work to, to go in and, and facilitate one aspect of this, I think there's so many of us within the community that would also love to contribute different seeds, different species, you know, incorporating mushrooms and spores and working to also support our ecosystems, you know, our winged ones, our four legged and, and all of the relations that are part of the system that when we're looking at a complete decimation of a forest, all of the animals and the creatures that also rely on different food sources and whatnot, and, and how we can help to contribute to say, hey, there's a crew of us gardeners that would love to, to start growing X, Y, and Z seeds for you and providing these. And, and also, you know, I, I'm a park ranger um, for the BLM, and again, when we're talking about different agencies, and, and switching the mindset, you know, there, there's a scarlet letter on, on so many uniforms. And I think it's up to those of us that care about these things to help to shift that mindset so that when people are thinking about the Forest Service, when they're thinking about the BLM, when they're thinking about certain organizations, they're like, wow, doesn't it, doesn't it suck? I, I actually was in uniform one day and I had somebody walk up to me and say, you know, doesn't it suck to work for the Forest Service? And I was like, actually, I work for the BLM, but I love my job and I love what I do. And I love being a steward for the land. And, and as an educator, working with young ones, being able to, as a community, when we're talking about e economy, because this is economy too, this helps to build our economy. When we can inspire our little ones to be excited about germination and the process of, of watching a seedling grow into a tree and into a plant that then provides fruit and food 
when we can start getting different generations excited again to want to be in the forest and to do these jobs, we do put New Mexico on the map for, for economy that has everything to do with sustaining our community. So I would just love to know how we as a community can also contribute seeds and education programs, if there are little education programs to say, hey little ones, this is part of what we're doing for reforestation. You know, do you wanna be on board for this? And, and how that might be a part of the plan. Hey, can I hand you the mic? <laughs> 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 oh, oh, no, that I, I was just, there's that four shows workshop coming up in November. There is a four service workshop coming up in November, uh, and it's open to the community. Uh, where they're listening to the community and getting in, insights and how we can all come together to share that stewardship about what is needed. So. Look for it. it. It's it's coming up in November. I Jack, when when is it? Mid November. Okay. What's that? Can't remember the dates. Fourteenth. Yeah. There's three dates. It's um, I think you can go online and register, and it's free. And it's it, it is one step forward. But I think I want to address um, kind of that heartfelt. This is what I'm talking about when we have to think differently and we have to bring more participants to the table. Um, I, I know when I worked with the tribe, we had the opportunity to gather our own seed, grow our own seedlings in, in the nursery where we grew the seedlings. Inoculating them with the mycelium was, trees don't grow without it. You know, it's, it's like, I think, there is a, a big and deep um, conversation in all of those people involved in reforestation around the mycelium. That's not, the, the trees aren't being planted out there without that. But I think there's still a lot, a lot to learn from all of us. Um, and I, I know like when we're doing um, restoration work, there's, different kinds of funding for different types of things. And it's really only the tip of the iceberg of what can be done. And I just love working with private landowners whose land is firm because they don't get limited by what the government programs are funding. They can think outside the box. And so we can do more riparian restoration, more planting wildflowers, more putting shrubs in and things like that. And um, I, I think your point about the youth is just incredibly important. It's like these lands are, this is their legacy. This is what we're leaving them with is a lot of burnt forest. And so engaging youth as early as possible. I, I've got a great picture in my office of a two-year-old holding a tray of seedlings. Um, and it just means so much to me to have young people, um, you know, school groups come out and plant trees or do things. I, it's just, you're hitting on a lot of things that really hit on my heart So thank you. We have time for one more question. I saw a new hand shoot up in the back, provided it's a brief question and a brief answer, and then uh, I'll close this out because we're running up against our time here. So. I was gonna be two questions. One of them was, has Towns County uh, lost out on the possibility of, of getting a, a nursery set up here. And uh, two is, you guys are doing a bunch of great things. Can you just give us a, a brief north to south what's happening across the jurisdictions and, and where we're starting uh, to put money on the ground and what, what good things have happened out there? <laughs> um, I wouldn't say we've missed out. I think we we're enjoying the fact that our neighbors on the east are going to have this badass facility right in the neighborhood. Oh, does that sound about right to you? Yeah, sounds about right. Okay, <laughs> so that's my answer to that one. Um, there's a ton of really cool stuff going on when it comes to the actual restoration, and so for those who leave tonight and 
If you're intrigued by what we're talking about, I think Matt's going to put a slide up um, for where you can go to figure out how to get involved. Steve, definitely take notes on that one. You can see my contact info is there. We have two groups. One is called the Taos Valley Watershed Coalition. It starts in San Cristo, where I live, and it goes all the way down into the Rio Grande del Rancho. And we're doing a ton of thinning and restoration work around San Cristobal. We just completed some work up the road to the Ski Valley where we could. We're doing work uh, on Taos Canyon. That's really just starting now, uh, including along the tribe's border uh, in partnership with Taos Pueblo and the Forest Service. And then there's an area in the Rio Grande del Rancho, that's the watershed that comes down into Delta and Ranchos. And we just got the environmental assessment completed there, which opens that area up for work as well. And then if you move over to the Añasco side of the mountain, at least in Taos County, we have been there and are continuing to do a ton of work on forest service lands and on a bunch of other lands around the communities of Valle, Las Trampas, Chamisal, and Peñasco. Um, and the one, the one thing, and I want to hand the mic to Renee on this one, the, the gaping hole, if you look at that Taos Valley landscape, is Taos Pueblo, and what Renee described uh, early in the conversation, which is the Blue Lake Wilderness, which is the headwaters of the Rio Pueblo, uh, as well as the Rio Lucero, which both feed water into, and into the town of Taos and around the town of Taos. It's, it's impossible to overstate how important that watershed is to our community and how devastating a catastrophic fire in that watershed would be. And so, Renee, do you want to take a few minutes to, to talk about you know, how we can help Taos Pueblo in your effort to, to address the forest health concerns up in that watershed? Is that okay? Sure. Thank you, JR, for um, prepping that. It is a critical location um, for many reasons. Number one is it sits above the town of Taos and the, and the village of the Pueblo. But we are working on, um, number one, the authority to work within the wilderness. Without that ability, we can't do it. These practitioners who got together and, and threw together this paper, sent it out. They said, spread it out far and wide because we need to change our outlook at what we can do within the wilderness. Now, I'm not going to say it's every wilderness. Some wildernesses need to be left alone, but others need to be managed. They need to be mitigated. So that's the first step. Number two, we're looking at a tribal council resolution internally so that we can put all our resources together to make this the top priority that we want to do and proactively do everything we can to prevent a high severity fire up there. Now, we're surrounded by three wildernesses in Taos County. We've got the Honda Columbine, we've got the Wheeler Peak, and we've got the Blue Lake. And then on the southern part, we've even got the Pecos Wilderness. So we're predominantly heavily in wilderness. And I'm not saying that we have to work in all of them, but there's strategic locations where it's gonna buy us a lot to do some work. So that authority is, is critical. And we're looking at getting some, some, some critical. The next piece is, okay, NEPA. We need a programmatic EA. Project level NEPAs don't work. They're too slow, they're too cumbersome. We gotta have a pro programmatic EA to then encompass all that, all those drainages, all that watershed, and to look at it so that we're just, we have the ability to go in there and do that. So that is what the nut that we're looking at, at getting and any kind of support. And like I said, we, we're gonna put this link up to this paper and look at it because these people came together for a reason, because they loved their job, they loved the land that they worked on. This was a passion with them, and they said, we see the issue, and we need to come up with a better way of dealing with it. I hope that. Quickly puts it into, into perspective. And the link to that paper is, is up there. And just a point of clarification if folks don't understand, when we say, when they say it's wilderness, it's the legal definition of wilderness where you cannot use mechanized equipment within, so no cutting trees. Um, generally, this is oversimplifying, generally a little more difficult to do management type of work. 
But uh, with that, please everybody uh, join me in thanking our panelists. Resources up here. Um, uh, maybe the first one for folks here, the TowsCountyWildfire.org, and, and some other resources. But thank you all for coming and making is, this. Is there event. a website where you can put this document so I can come out and find yep. these? Uh, I'm not. Here, here. Well, PR trick will tell you all of this great stuff. So a couple of things. One, um, the Harwood Museum has a YouTube channel. They've been recording this, and they'll show it on their YouTube channel. Um, you'll also we'll also produce a blog about this on nature.org slash New Mexico that will include links like this. Awesome. And also, you're going to be getting a survey from me, because I'm in marketing and we love surveys, and if you like tonight's event, we need to know that so that we can tell the people who funded this, yes, this was a great event, please give us money to do this again. So, um, you can always write back to me and tell me how great you like this, so we'll use this information and I'll help you connect you to anybody else you need. Thanks so much for coming, and I hope you have a safe travel. Thank you. Thank you.